Welcome back to News Talk. Wisconsin voters go to the polls today. New Yorkers cast ballots later this month. Who knew the two states that cast ballots so long after uh, the spotlight states of Iowa and New Hampshire could be factors in the Republican and Democratic Party's presidential nominating process, particularly on the GOP side, where Ted Cruz had the late momentum going into Wisconsin balloting this month's results. It, it is clear, do matter. National Review reporter Tim Alberta joins us now with more on all this. Good to have you back. Glad Bruce. to have you uh, here while you're off the campaign trail for a bit. Uh, let's talk about uh, Wisconsin and let's talk about uh, the, uh, the opportunity Ted Cruz has to really emerge as, a, as the chief and primary rival to uh, the man who's been the front runner for so long, Donald Trump, and the broader uh, uh, on, on social media, sometimes it's, you see hashtag never Trump. Not all of those people love Ted Cruz, but there is a kind of union there, Cruz and this, this group, this loosely coalition uh, group, wanting to take down a guy they see is very, very dangerous for the Republican brand. Yeah, it's very interesting to see Ted Cruz sort of emerge as the de facto anti-Trump vessel for a lot of Republicans. And Wisconsin is a particularly interesting place to look at that because in the Milwaukee suburbs, where a lot of your sort of classic center-right middle upper class affluent white collar Republicans reside, that is an area where you would think that they might be more disposed to voting for a John Kasich perhaps, or maybe they would be a classic Marco Rubio voter if he were still in the race. Uh, Ted Cruz, not a natural fit for that constituency. Ted Cruz very much ran his campaign from day one, appealing towards evangelicals, ultra conservatives, looking at a number of these southern states that voted on Super Tuesday because of that. So this is the situation we now find ourselves in, and this entire election cycle has been nothing if not unexpected and bizarre. So this is sort of the latest twist. And if Ted Cruz can pull off a big victory tonight in Wisconsin, which the polls tell us that he will, then that's going to be a really interesting uh, path moving forward for Ted Cruz because he's going to start targeting similar suburban areas in Pennsylvania in some of these Acela corridor sta states that vote later in April. And then again in some of these other Midwestern states in early May. So we have the possibility of a Cruz victory over Trump in Wisconsin and, and, and possibly not a narrow victory. We'll see as the votes come in, of course. It could be an impressive uh, victory that he will understandably crow about. Couple that with what could be the case for John Kasich, where he finishes third, but based on Wisconsin's delegate allocation process, he leaves uh, this contest with more delegates than uh, Trump. We're, we're, for conversation purposes, we're putting Trump second. Uh, Trump's uh, pursuit of 1237 gets really complicated uh, if the two uh, factors that I just mentioned occur tonight. Well, essentially, the position that Donald Trump is in right now is, uh, is a precarious one. He is still on track, theoretically, to hit 1237 if future results sort of line up and fall in uh, line with past results. The issue is going to be the margin of error here, and, there's, and it's diminishing by the day. If Donald Trump emerges from Wisconsin with zero delegates, which is a possibility, it's not likely, but it's mm. a possibility, then he would need to win about 60 percent of all remaining delegates moving forward. Donald Trump is most likely to probably win two congressional districts in Wisconsin tonight. There is a very northernmost district and a very westernmost district in Wisconsin that are very rural, very blue-collar, non-college educated electorates there. That, those are the areas where Donald Trump is expected to do well. Even if he t walks away with six delegates, maybe he wins an extra district and takes another three, he walks away with nine. He is suddenly has a little less and a little less margin for error with every subsequent state. And that is the issue that as you get into late April, there's a lot of talk, Bruce, about how this campaign winds through Donald Trump's backyard all of a sudden. We go up to New York on April 19th, and then on the 26th, we have Delaware, Maryland, Rhode Island, Connecticut. Those states on paper are strong for Trump, but he has very little margin for error. If he cedes even a few delegates in any of those states to Ted Cruz, suddenly he's not on track anymore. Very, very fascinating uh, stuff. Let's talk about the Democrats. Uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, it, it, I don't think there, a lot of folks will be surprised if, if uh, Sanders does well in Wisconsin. We then pivot to the state that Hillary Clinton represented in the U.S. Senate for many years and where she and uh, former President Bill Clinton still have a, have a home. Can she end the race with a win there? Mathematically, no. But uh, in terms of perceptions and in terms of the media narrative, sure, she, she could really put a stranglehold thing, uh, uh, on the race at that point, Bruce. And you already have most of the Democratic Party, whether they are for Bernie or for Hillary, essentially shrugging their shoulders at this point and saying, look, you know, the math just isn't there for him. He's not going to have any kind of viable path to the nomination. Even if Bernie Sanders scores an overwhelming victory in Wisconsin tonight, which doesn't look likely based on the polls, he seems like he's going to win, but not by any kind of lopsided amount. 
yeah, even then, there is just no way that he can hope to close the, the delegate gap at this point. Now, they're going to go to Wisconsin, and they're going to debate next week, as we saw uh, CNN brokered an agreement with the two campaigns to debate. I think it's going to be in Brooklyn. So that's going to be sort of a, a pivotal moment for Bernie Sanders, a last stand, if you will. And he hails from the city, too, remember. So he's, going to, he's, going, to, he's <laughs> going to try and do everything he can to pull out the stops in Brooklyn when the two of them debate. But barring some sort of miracle at this point, it's just very difficult to see how he could surpass her in the delegate count. Is there pressure on him to, to get out so that uh, the Democrats can start to marshal and unify behind a nominee? Uh, the, you know, there's all this talk about how the Republican Party is imploding, how their nominee is likely to be a potential disaster, not just for the White House hopes, but, but for Congress as well. But nothing is a sure thing in politics. How much pressure is on Sanders right now? There's a lot of pressure on Sanders. But you know what the problem is for the Democrats right now, Bruce, is that Pressure only works when there's a carrot, not just a stick. And Bernie Sanders is not a young man. He does not have a future in the Democratic Party. Classically, if you look at a presidential campaign in a primary, Republican or Democrat, the best way to pressure someone out of the race is to remind them in not so subtle terms that, look, you have a future in the Democratic Party, whether that's running for president four sure. years from now, whether it's a high profile cabinet position. I don't think Bernie Sanders is inter interested in any of those things. And that makes it very difficult for the powers that be in the Democratic Party to whisper into his ear and say, hey, Senator, you know, now's, now's the time we really need to unify as a party. I just don't think that's very effective. Uh, on both sides, here we are in April with still a lot at stake in these contests that are taking place now and in the weeks to come. Tim Alberta, reporter for National review. Always fantastic having you here. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Bruce. We'll step aside. We are back with more News Talk right after this.